in our Polina. Yes, amazing. Let's go. Come on. To this crack in time and the entry point to the other world and the land of the dead. Exactly 15 years ago, radical anthropology was being very, very naughty. Um, and we brought, we danced on the grave of capitalism and brought Canary Wharf to a halt with a bunch of pumpkins, a samba band and four horsemen of the apocalypse under a new moon, it should be said. Um, so that was in honor of, well, it was, it was the inaugural uh, performance or debut of the government of the dead. Um, now we weren't members of the government because you have to be dead to be a member of the government. <laughs> um, we were agents, but what the slogan was that went with our political actions was the only good government is a dead government. And it has to be said that in the 15 years since then, we have not changed our minds. <laughs> Quandary this week about um, inviting people to put on Halloween costumes. You know, we we made a little effort here, um, and coming to do to hear fairy tales, whilst in the out, in the outside world we're witnessing such horrors and appalling situations. And you know, whatever date we focus on, whether it's a particular date of the crimes being perpetrated, or the entire picture of the ultra fuck up of patriarchy which is occurring and destroying this planet and our futures how how is it that it's right to be celebrating like halloween um and enjoying ourselves or listening to fairy stories you know, what why is it worth doing that what 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 good does it do but halloween or sawain to give us older name um it really is the most, the oldest uh, indigenous, the oldest documented, still existing rituals of respect for the dead in these islands. It, it has that indigenous tradition going back thousands of years into the Neolithic. There will be Neolithic tombs and barrows which, which have Sawaiian calendrical alignments. Um, and on this November date, or October, November date, um, that points to cattle people who owned cattle, but moved the cattle from the uplands to come back down for the winter. And of course, livestock being slaughtered would be the, particularly the, the marking point of, of Halloween. So these were cattle people. They weren't necessarily very egalitarian. They could have been um, fairly patriarchal peoples. Um, but these are very old traditions indeed in sort of Celtic Indo-European but the fairy tales may be even even older um, and the fairy tales are really the true survivors of patriarchy they come through from before war before patriarchy they've had to dive down underground to become children's stories or old wives tales um, to hide under the, co the cover of patriarchy, to keep, keep under the radar, um, because they have powerful anti-patriarchal messages. Um, and so we feel that it's very much justified to lock into these traditions, which are respect of the dead, um, and which are taking us back to a world, to the pictures of a world before, patriarchy before warfare in many senses um, and also to say to that that whereas Swain and Halloween may be pointing to like cattle and farming culture the fairy tales that Chris is going to um, give us a flavor of tonight really they go back deeper time I would argue they're paleolithic provenance or mesolithic provenance they go back into a time of hunting people how do we know this because the stories are talking about great forests, woods, where huntsmen roam. Um, yes, there's kings and queens and princesses and princes, but notice that the princes 
are always coming to where the girl is. And the line, the royal lineage is the mother, the queen to the daughter. The men move. This is matrilineal. It's matrilocal. That is the opposite of what a farming or cattle people would be. So I think we can make these claims about just how old fairy tales may represent some of the indigenous remnants of the cultures of old Europe, and possibly old Eurasia, um, generally speaking. So let me hand over for Chris, who's who's been doing this work with fairy tales with Rag for he's a, a wizened wizard now, <laughs> 40 and more years. So hand over. To okay. You. Um, this is from the complete Grimm's fairy tales, uh, Little Briar Rose, otherwise known, of course, as uh, the Sleeping Beauty. A long time ago, there were a king and queen who said every day, ah, ah, if only we had a child, but they never had one. But it happened that once when the queen was bathing, a frog crept out of the water onto the land and said to her, your wish shall be fulfilled before a year has gone by, you shall have a daughter. What the frog had said came true and the queen had a little girl who was so pretty that the king could not contain himself for joy and ordered a great feast. He invited not only his kindred, friends and acquaintances, but also the wise women in order that they might be kind and well disposed towards the child. There were 13 of them in the kingdom, but as he had only 12 golden plates for them to eat out of, one of them had to be left at home. The feast was held with all manner of splendor, and when it came to an end, the wise women bestowed their magic gifts upon the baby. One gave virtue, another beauty, a third riches, and so on with everything in the world, that one can wish for. When 11 of them had made their promises, suddenly the 13th came in. She wished to avenge herself for not having been invited and without greeting or even looking at anyone, she cried with a loud voice, the king's daughter shall in her 15th year prick herself with a spindle and fall down dead. And without saying a word more, she turned around and left the room. They were all shocked. But the twelfth wise woman, whose good wish still remained unspoken, came forward, and as she could not undo the evil sentence, but only soften it, she said, It shall not be death, but a deep sleep of a hundred years into which the princess shall fall. The king, who would fain keep his dear child from the misfortune, gave orders that every spindle in the whole kingdom should be burnt. Meanwhile, the gifts of the wise women were plentifully fulfilled on the young girl because she was so beautiful, modest, good-natured and wise that everyone who saw her was bound to love her. It happened that on the very day when she was 15 years old, the king and queen were not at home and the maiden was left in the palace quite alone. So she went round into all sorts of places, looked into rooms and bedchambers just as she liked and at last came to an old tower. She climbed up the narrow winding staircase and reached a little door. The key was in the lock. Bang open. And there in a little room sat an old woman who was busy spinning a flat. Good day, old mother, said the king's daughter. What are you doing there? I am spinning, said the old woman and nodded her head. What sort of thing is that that rattled around so merrily, said the girl. And she took the spindle and wanted to spin too. But scarcely had she touched the spindle when the magic decree was fulfilled and she pricked her finger on it. And in the very moment when she felt the prick, she fell down upon the bed. She fell down upon the bed that stood there and lay in a deep sleep. And this sleep extended over the whole palace. The king and queen who had just come home and had entered the great hall began to go to sleep and the whole of the court with them. The horses, too, went to sleep in the stable, the dogs in the yard, the pigeons on the roof, the flies on the wall, even the fire that was flaming on the hearth became quiet and slept. The roast meat left off frizzling, and the cook, who was just going to pull the hair of the scullery boy because he had forgotten something, let him go, and he, too, went to sleep. 
and the wind fell. And on the trees before the castle, not a leaf moved again. But round about the castle, there began to grow a hedge of thorns, which every year became higher, and at last grew close up round the castle and all over it, so there was nothing of it to, to be seen, not even the flag upon the roof. But the story of the beautiful sleeping brow rose, for so the princess was named, went about the country, so that from time to time king's sons came and tried to get through the thorny hedge into the castle. But they found it impossible, for the thorns held fast together as if they had hands, and the youths who were caught in them could not get loose again, and died a miserable death. <clears throat> After long, long years, the king's son came again to that country and heard an old man talking about the thorn hedge, and that a castle was said to stand behind it, in which a wonderfully beautiful princess named Briarose had been asleep for a hundred years, and that the king and queen and the whole court were asleep likewise. He had heard too from his grandfather that many king's sons had already come and had tried to get through the thorny hedge, but they remained sticking fast in it and had died a pitiful death. Then the youth said, I'm not afraid. I will go and see the beautiful brow rose. The good old man might dissuade him as he would. He did not listen to his words. But by this time, the hundred years had just passed and the day had come when Briar Rose was to awake again. When the king's son came to the thorn hedge, it was nothing but large and beautiful flowers which parted from each other of their own accord and let him pass unhurt. And then they closed again behind him like a hedge. In the castle yard, he saw the horses and the spotted hounds lying asleep. On the roof sat the pigeons with their heads under their wings. And when he entered the house, the flies were asleep upon the wall the cook in the kitchen was still holding out his hand to seize the boy, and the maid was sitting by the black hen, which she was just going to pluck. He went on farther, and in the great hall he saw whole, the whole of the court lying asleep, and up by the throne lay the king and queen. Then he went on still further, and all was so quiet that a breath could be heard, and at last he came to the tower and opened the door into the little room where Briar Rose was sleeping. There she lay, so beautiful that he could not turn his eyes away, and he stooped down and gave her a kiss. But as soon as he kissed her, Briar Rose opened her eyes, awoke, and looked at him quite sweetly. Then they went down together, and the king awoke, and the queen, and the whole court, and looked at each other in great astonishment. And the horses in the courtyard stood up and shook themselves. The hounds jumped up and wagged their tails. The pigeons upon the roof pulled out their heads from under their wings looked around and flew into the open country. The flies on the wall crept again, and the fire in the kitchen burned up and flickered and cooked the meat. The joint began to turn and sizzle again, and the cook gave the boy such a box on the ear that he screamed, and the maid finished plucking the fowl. And then the marriage of the king's son with Brow Rose was celebrated with all splendour, and they lived contented to the end of their days. So, <laughs> um, I remember when I was at Stuttgart University, kind of interested in all sorts of things I shouldn't have been interested in, um, kind of getting a sense that some, over, the, over the channel there was this amazing anthropologist. I wasn't doing anthropology, I was doing completely different subject. But this anthropologist, whose all of his work was in French at that time, had... Um, and it's something absolutely astonishing. He'd, he'd shown how to apply science, kind of real science, like you know, like Einstein, to not just like physics, chemistry, molecules, biology, all this stuff, but to music, art, culture, thought, everything that makes us human. He, he managed to show that everything kind of fitted together. That there was a logic, an underlying logic to all the things we do. When, of course we'd all assume that, okay, in culture, you can sort of do anything, whatever you feel like, whatever kind of tradition, there was no reason why everything should be, sort of, you know, should hang together. And um, I'll cut a long story short, of course. To prove his point, um, some years later in the 70s, Levi Strauss decided to stop his previous studies of uh, kinship, for example, um, or, or ritual, and focus on mythology. 
And he did that because his argument was that in mist, and anything can happen. You can defy gravity, you can die and come alive again. There's none of the normal constraints of physics um, apply in mythology. And so he said, well, if even here, even in the realm of myths and fairy tales, you can still discern scientific constraints like laws which have to be obeyed, even by storytellers who feel themselves to be free to make up any tale, if even they actually, in, in practice, they conform to patterns which a scientific, uh, which a scientist can, can detect, and that proves there's something about the architecture of the human mind responsible for our myths, rituals, kinship systems, for all the different products of culture. There's something about the human mind uh, which these cultural products, including myths, kind of point to. We can, we can discover kind of what it means to be human, but particularly what it means to have a, a human mind by studying, even studying myths, let alone all the various other things which, of course, uh, social anthropologists um, study. So he wrote four massive volumes called Mythology, an introduction to the science of mythology. And uh, when I was here at UCL, I wrote a PhD, um, which was a kind of reanalysis of Claude Lévy-Sauté's mythology. Um, I won't really go into that. We've got to get to the, sto <laughs> the story in a moment. Um, but um, what Levi Strauss said is the last chapter of the final volume of mythology. Have we got any room for people? There, quite a few there, people that there is to, room up to here. Me. And there's um, chairs you're here. You're not very good at chiming, all of you people. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, it is Halloween. And uh, as Camilla said, it is a cracking right. time. So. Um, so the final chapter of Claude Lévi-Strauss's mythology is called One Myth Only. And in that um, final chapter, he makes this astonishing claim that all the world's magical myths and fairy tales are variations on a theme. The theme remains the same. The theme is as old as the hills, actually as old as Homo sapiens, as old as going right back to the time when we first became humans speaking language with, with the kinds of minds that all of us humans have. So we have one myth, um, and, um, and this myth is like a, a kind of super myth, like a web of mythology embracing the entire planet, almost as if all of us around the entire planet kind of know the story. It's, it, 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 of course, he says, the underlying logic of the myths um, is constant. And I think the way to perceive that is to think in terms of um, life on Earth. All the different uh, forms of life on Earth, all the whales and the dolphins and the you know, fruit flies and the humans, and the, all, all emerge out of a certain structure, which is dioxyribonucleic acid, DNA. So we have CGTA, the, the basic components of the, of the genetic code, and they can be arranged in different ways. And because the code remains the same, because that genetic code is as old as life on Earth, it's that, it's that which enables that diversity. So let me say, so not saying all the myths are the same, he's saying the underlying syntax and the underlying kind of formal code of the world's mythology is the same. And I'm going to have to again cut it all a bit short. You might say, "Well, what is this? What is the what is the the basic myth um, from which all the others derive? What's this? What's this underlying constant pattern which is invariant?" And I'm sort of putting it in my own way, but I think it's I think it's fair. It is what Levi Strauss says. It it runs like this: We're alive. Um, you can see people. We can see each other. Um, things are happening. People are working, um, cooking food, having sex, looking after kids, doing all sorts of everyday activities. So that's life. And then there's the flow of blood. And it triggers a, a transition into the land of the dead. So we've moved from life into death. And there's nothing magic about that. It's just you were alive, 
you know, we're dead. And then comes the magic bit. We come back from the dead. All the world's magical myths are versions of that story of death followed magically. I mean, there's no magic trick more extraordinary than to die and then come back alive again. All the world's magical myths are just various different ways of telling that truth. That after death, there's new life. Um, so sort of bear that in mind with this story that, that I've just read out to you. And um, this, this works best as a kind of workshop rather than just me talking and talking and talking. So if I could ask a question, I mean, how many of you sort of knew the story already? Yeah. Oh, that's very, 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 very good. Okay, that's fantastic. Quite often I find that people sort of weren't read fairy tales when they were little kids, but that's very, very encouraging. Okay. Right. Of all the different motifs in the story, Supposing you're sort of forgetting some of them and not quite sure of all the details. What's the image, Levi Strauss would say, the motif in the story which sticks in your mind most prominently? Um, I mean, there are various alternatives, but perhaps you can just come up with a few. When she falls asleep. Okay, any more? When she wakes up. When she wakes up. Right. Okay, when she falls asleep. What's the picture you have? What makes her fall asleep and what's the picture? If that's the one you've chosen. This girl, what age is she? 14, 15, I think it's her 15th birthday. She pricks her finger and falls down dead, but only for a period. Quite a long period. But she calls it happened to hit for a period. <laughs> well, one of the things we have to realize, and this is really what Levitz has taught us more than anything else, respect the stories. They know what they're talking about. At first sight, they seem to be absurdity piled upon absurdity. But be careful. These stories are crystallized collective wisdom. I would actually say kind of science collective knowledge and um when we speak in, in language all the time this is a kind of sort of relatively recent realization we are using metaphor now a metaphor is a false statement it's no no metaphor is literally true it's always wrong it's false right it's a cliche um in romeo and juliet juliet is the sun no, she's a woman. She's got two legs. She's a human being. That's the sun up there. The hot ball. Hydrogen atoms fusing. I'm going to create a group. Because my super serious day. It was a. It was. I was on a photo in London School of Hygiene. It was a day. Can you mute, please? Just, can everyone mute? Yeah. All right. Can I, we I wanted them to unmute so they could join the talk. That's okay. Right. So all of language is built out of metaphor and every metaphor is a is a falsehood it's, it can't be true but they're helpful falsehoods they're fiction if you like false statements from which we can guess an intended meaning so when we hear a metaphor we don't just reject it as wrong as not true we think well what can they mean and of course in, in Roman Juliet um I, I, thinking about this now Romeo is probably referring to um, her radiance, which is, you know, the sun is radiant. So in any fairy tale, all the things which can't possibly be true, <laughs> we've got to think about it and realise that there are ways of saying something which can't be said um, just boldly, just literally. Um, so let's take... Um, we've got two candidates for the sort of central motif of the story. One is um, uh, Little Briar Rose comes of age, 
Uh, she's 15 and she pricks her finger uh, and bleeds, presumably, and falls down dead. And the other is that she wakes up with a very, very deep sleep. Um, I have a feeling that the waking up from the deep sleep, waking up, being kissed on the lips by this lovely um, prince, and then waking up, happy, alive, getting married. Not sure that's that difficult to interpret. It's, it's not cryptic, is it? It's, <laughs> she wakes up from asleep and um, old wise woman spinning, spinning, spinning. Um, okay, it means something absolutely central to what it means to be human. What could it be? A girl comes of age and pricks the thing. Yeah. <laughs> is this story is for children? And it's a story for children, of course. Well, we, I mean, it, it is an old wives' tales, which are not were not designed to be just read to children. They were part of, you know, part of folk wisdom. Why don't you be? Why don't all of you just be brave? Just, <laughs> just be brave. What can it mean? The girl is fifteen and she pricks her finger. She started to bleed. Okay. Is there any other possibility? I mean, yes. I mean, it's important to explore just in case somebody thinks that's a bit far fetched. I mean, does anyone? I mean, maybe it's a bit far fetched. Surely it can't be about menstruation. This story because menstruation is you know, one doesn't talk about menstruation. Does one? Does, that, does one talk about menstruation? I don't think so. But. So anyway, is there no there's no sort of controversy here? Everyone's more or less happy. The thing is, we can tell whether that's the right interpretation. Because again, as Claude Davis Strauss says, these stories know what they're talking about. They don't hop about from one topic to another. There's always a consistent logical thread. And one of the things which Davis Strauss says beautifully is that they're trying to get the story, they're sort of trying to get a message across, and it's meeting resistance. And when a message meets resistance, it's no good just whispering it. There's no good just saying it once. If you say it this way, try another way, try another way, try another way. Try saying the same thing so many different ways that hopefully, eventually, the message will come through, overcoming resistance to it. So if this young woman picking a finger, bleeding and falling down dead, if that's a reference to menstruation, it should decode um, the rest of the story. So let's get back to the beginning. How does it all begin? We have a king and a queen, and they have a problem. What's the problem? Yeah? Jealousy. Sorry? Jealousy. Ah! The one who's left out. I was thinking of the very first line of the story. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so now, it's about fertility or the lack of it, isn't it? They seem to lack fertility. So whose problem is it exactly in the story? I mean, the king, I would suggest, seems to be having problems. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, he seems to be unable to get his wife. Does, does he get some help? Now, when um, the queen gets pregnant, it's actually not thanks to the king at all. Is it? It's thanks to a frog. Okay. And what happens in the story, and there are different versions, of course, but the, the frog in a pool, the, the queen's in the garden, the pool here, frog pops up, jumps up, and with a great you know, splash, lands in her lap. And it does the trick. And then the frog explains that you know, within a year you'll have um, a little girl. Um, now, what happens? Remember, we've decoded the central puzzle of the story. We've said it's, it concerns the girl's first menstruation. And we already know it's, it's a, something to do with fertility. When a girl menstruates, what does the blood signify? It signifies, of course, her fertility. That's what it signifies. But now, uh, the king and queen have to organize a ceremony. In some of the versions, it's kind of a christening, but if it's not a christening exactly, it's a naming ceremony. She has to be given a name. 
Um, and, and at any rate, certain people have to be invited um, to this event. And who are these people? How many wise women are there in the kingdom? Thirteen. Why does one have to be left out? Why does the king have to say, no, no, I can only have twelve? Right. What kind of plates are they? Hmm? Are they silver or gold? It's a very good question, but what's the answer? Twelve golden plates. Right. If the gold, if the twelve plates are made of gold, what might the thirteen plates, which they should have been because they're thirteen wise women, what metal might those ones have been made out of? Not gold, but <laughs> silver. Right. So now, what I've said is, again, if Levi Strauss is right and these stories know what they're talking about, the theme of menstruation, the theme of fertility, or its absence, or, or its sort of blockage, should be made at the beginning of the story. So we've got an interesting question. We have 13, I think, silver plates. It's not made all that clear, but we deduce it would be logical. And 13 golden plates. Let's start with the golden ones. 13, sorry, 12 golden plates. And don't forget the king, who's recited on the figure 12, and the metal gold. Whereas it's the wise women who will have 13 silver plates. Right, 12 gold plates. What might they possibly mean? Given that it's all about time. <laughs> How many months are in the year? Really? <laughs> right. What's the difference? What's we, what have we got here? We've got a contradiction or a contest between two, what would you say, two ways of measuring time. One way, time is measured by 13 wise women. Another way, time is measured by a man, I mean, a king. Now, the king seems to think there are 12 months in the year. Got 12 golden plates. The wise women seem to think, no, there are 13 months. Now, what should we be calling those months if there are 13 of them or if they're silver? 13 moons. And of course, we do know, don't we, that you can't really fit 12, you can't fit 13 months in a solar year. If you want to fix the year to a particular length of time, um, because the seasons are important to, to be aware of, then you're going to have always some bit of the 13th sort of poking out. You can't quite squeeze it in if you're using the moon as your, as your, as your measurement of, of, of time. So we seem to have a conflict, and it seems that the king, um, we might say, has a problem. Um, and I always think of it because I was born up a Catholic, Roman Catholic. It's a problem which um, patriarchal religions in general seem to have. Um, for me, um, the Christian churches, um, and don't forget all of our colleges, universities, or once theology colleges, I've always realized, thought that you know, these um, theologians basically have a problem with two things one's women, and the other's the moon. And you'll notice that our king in the story has a bit of a problem with menstruation, and he seems to have a definite problem with the moon and with those 13 wise women whose, whose silver plates um, are, are theirs. So anyway, he, he rejects the 13th. He's clearly saying there are only 12 months in a year. And of course, the months which we use under patriarchy are, let's face it, they are man-made months, which is why there have been endless squabbles and schisms and heresies and <laughs> between the different branches of the, of the patriarchal churches as to how, how you measure these months. You've got Julian calendar, Gregorian calendar, Orthodox, I mean, you know, you can't, there's, there's no reason for, uh, what is it, uh, 30 days, that's a, that's September, April, June, and November, I mean, it's, it's completely arbitrary because it's man-made. 
but coming from the way the sun and the moon are, are in real life circling around this, this beautiful planet of ours. Uh, so, right, the 13th will be excluded. Now, I want to think about now the 13 wise women. Um, they're bringing gifts. And we're told that they're, they're blessings, aren't they, really, it seems to me. Their beauty, skill, a beautiful voice, she should dance beautifully, she should all this. Anything a young man could possibly wish for in a bride, these are the blessings given her by the, the fairies. Yeah? Um, the 13th blessing is rejected by the king. What happens if you come with a blessing and it's rejected? It turns into uh, a curse. A curse? Mm -hmm. A curse? The curse! <laughs> yeah? The curse! You seem to be on the right track. The story seems to be knowing what it's talking about. So, the curse. So, the king apparently, well, all right, let's, time passes. The girl comes of age. Clearly, um, she's going to, it's like the, the king's, you know, he's got authority. He's, he's a king. And, um, okay, he's not happy with all this. I should perhaps just go back a minute. Do you remember what happens? The 13th fairy utters her curse, and the curse is that she will come of age, she will bleed, um, but she will die. And death is death. She will die forever. Now, she's a very powerful fairy. But luckily, the 12th fairy hasn't yet given her blessing. And what she says is, well, I can commute the death sentence to a temporary death, but I can't counteract it. I can't, I can't say I can get rid of that curse, get rid of that spell, but I can make the death sentence into a death, but it'll be a death for only um, 100 years. So, and then off she goes. And of course, there's moaning and crying and groaning in the, in the palace. And of course, the king determines, uh, my daughter, when she comes of age, she will not bleed. She will not die. So how does he do it? What's he arrange? He arranges for all all the spindles um, to be burnt with a with a with a, with a, with a, with a, big, a big bonfire of all the spindles. And clearly, he's saying, um, "My daughter won't bleed." And you're thinking, "Hmm, can even a king?" Um, define nature in that way. He's got legislative power, he can pass laws, he can get all the spindles burnt, but you have a feeling, even though he's the king, uh, his power is not limitless. And sure enough, uh, as the girl grows up and comes of age, there's one final spindle which he didn't manage to burn. And up in the turret, there is the which fairy do you think she is up in the turret? Spinning, spinning, spinning. I think she's the 13th. Spinning, spinning, spinning. Spinster. Mm -hmm. The word spinster comes to mind, doesn't it? What's a spinster? A woman who's on the side of the blood and not on the side of marriage. She rejects marriage. She is a spinster. Spinning, spinning, spinning. And um, it's she's kind of the um, guardian spirit, the, the godmother of Little Briar Rose. And she meets her guardian spirit. It's, it's as if she meets the fairy who will give her, because it's the, this is the most powerful of all the fairies, the, the 13th one, actually the most valuable blessing of all. And in these stories, that would be the blessing of menstruation, the blessing of fertility. Nothing can beat that in terms of blessings. But the king doesn't get it once again. <laughs> he says, my daughter will not bleed. I'll make sure she doesn't. And you're just thinking, well, 
he's not, not going to about things the right way. <laughs> and of course, she comes of age and she's inside the palace and she's opening, pushing at all the doors, all the entrances, all the, she's exploring everything. She's just coming of age. And she finds an opening it leads up, 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 up to the turret in the sky, and she pushes open the door, and there's a 13th fairy spinning, spinning, spinning. Um, I think she's spinning the threads of cyclical time. She's with the moon, with menstruation. Menstruation, by the way, means moon change, of course. And she's spinning the threads of time, spinning, 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 and... Uh, Something pulls beauty to that spell. Doesn't matter what her father says. She pricks her finger, bleeds, and falls down into a sleep. Uh, one of the staple findings of social anthropology all around the world, in every single traditional culture, doesn't matter what the scientists say, all the various medical scientists, they say menstruation, it's nothing magical about that. It's not poisonous. It's not supernaturally potent. It's just a bit of blood. <laughs> Indigenous cultures have none of that. It, menstruation is an extraordinarily potent substance, substance, subject to all sorts of rules of respect, if you like. We might call them taboos, but they're respectful. Be very careful around menstruation. What happens in... I, I could name it almost any sort of Mediterranean culture traditionally, any, any you know, any Aboriginal Australian culture. What happens to a girl on her first menstruation? Social anthropologists here, pipe up, please. Say what happens. What what happens to the girl? Conclusion. Sorry. Conclusion. I, okay, I'm sorry, I'm getting old and I'm a little bit deaf, but I think Ryan over there, I'm very glad to see. Ryan says, yeah, <laughs> Hello, right. She goes into seclusion. Now, what you have to know is that when you're in seclusion, you're temporarily dead. You're dead as a wife and you are alive as somebody different. You're alive as in terms of your blood relationships as a sister, a daughter in the blood while in seclusion, but no man should be gazing at you. You should be in the dark. And the basic rule is um, the sun should not shine on her head, nor her feet touch the ground. She's in the other world. She's dead to normal life, but particularly she's dead to things like cooking and marital sex and doing nice things for her husband. All that is out. She's like secluded. It's almost as if she's on strike to all these normal activities. And she's kind of putting herself first, although, of course, under patriarchy, it's all a bit, you know, a bit negative. But in many cultures, particularly African hunter-gatherer cultures, like, for example, the, the Babuti, when a girl comes of age and bleeds, it's a, it's a cause of immense um, rejoicing. She's been blessed by the moon. And she goes into a grass hut, the biggest in the, in the whole village. It's like a, a kind of temporary church, you might call it. Obviously, they don't call it a church. Um, it's, it, it's, um, it's, it's a, but it's the biggest structure they have. And she's there with her sister um, and her aunts, and they're celebrating her fertility, her blood. And the blood is kind of shared within the hut amongst all the different women, and it's a powerful blessing. Um, how long do you think a seclusion would, I say normally, it's not a very good word, but I mean, Roughly, in a, in, an egal in a gender egalitarian society, when a girl has her first menstrual period and her, her relatives celebrate it, roughly how long is she going to be in this condition, mm -hmm. separated from the boys, se separated from the male gaze in her special place in the dark um, and, and not allowed to touch the ground? I mean, just roughly. <laughs> That's very, 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 very good Sweet way of saying it. Probably. Yes, exactly. Less than 100 years. Probably a, half a month. Probably two weeks. Maybe a bit more. But I mean, certainly around that amount of time. Now, why do you think in this story she goes into seclusion for 100 years? That seems a bit excessive, doesn't it? Yeah. But I'm afraid, I, perhaps I should just check. Are you all happy that when she pricks her finger, she's menstruating? And then when she dies, that's like a code term for going into seclusion, dead to marital life, dead as a wife, but not necessarily dead 
as a blood relative, okay? So why do you think in this story, the seclusion lasts for so long? I mean, initially, of course, we, we understood she's gonna go into seclusion forever, or at least she's gonna die forever. And of course, it's the 12th sip fairy who um, commutes that death sentence into a seclusion for only um, 100 years. Um, I, I, I'm sorry. Any help with that? What? That's right. What I'm hearing here is the 13th wise woman. It's like, you men, you kings, you patriarchs, you think you can just get rid of our precious ritual and, and avoid her, being, her avoid the, cele the necessary celebration of her first menstrual period. We'll teach you a few things. She's going to have a period which is going to last 100 years. It's like, a, as you say, a punishment. Um, in the story, in seclusion, have you noticed how everything stops? Um, all the activities cease. And I'm um, thinking this young woman, she's certainly not having sex. No boys are allowed anywhere near. You could say she's on a sex strike. But what's interesting is that it's a kind of a, it's a general strike, isn't it? It's like the cooking stops. Um, all the activities in the, you know, in the scullery, the bakers, all the flunkies doing all their different jobs, you know, looking after the horses, uh, everything comes to a standstill and everyone's like, like fixed, like, like statues um, in, in their positions for a hundred years. Um, I like the idea of a strike. I read a whole book about it all called Blood Relations, Menstruation and the Origin of the Culture. And the way I see it is that one of the ways we actually became human was when women established a system called bride service, which hunter gatherers always have, which means that um, men who need or feel like they want sex are going to make themselves useful. And um, they do that in hunter gatherer societies by going and hunt, going, going hunting. And women's leverage is to be able to say collectively to men, um, uh, we, you can't just take us for granted. We own collectively our own bodies. And at least once a month, we're going to be proving that we own our own bodies by withdrawing from sex. Um, we like sex. We think you like sex. But if you want sex, and this would be in Africa, a message something like this, go away, hunting, bring back a zebra, and we'll think about it. <laughs> okay. But if you have Western style or patriarchy style marriage, the woman is wedlocked. The man has conjugal rights in the woman. She cannot say no because once upon a time, she said yes. She'd said yes when she was doing the marriage ceremony. Hunter gatherers don't do that. They don't have marriage in that sense. They don't have weddings. They have initiation rights like first menstruation rights and boys first skill rights. So um, I like to think of that in terms of solidarity and resistance mounted by women to make sure that they're not taken for granted by men so that women can say yes to sex, but also they can say no. Uh, yes means yes, or no means no. You know how it all goes. <laughs> um, and without that, women aren't free. And out of that collectivity, moral rules above all the rule against rape but against incest and all sorts of other forms of sexual abuse uh, emerged i mean there is another theory um, called levi strauss's theory actually which is that menstrual taboos were invented by men um, the incest taboo was invented by men uh, rules about cooking were invented by men and women are simply instruments in dealings between men uh, in Darwinian terms, the idea that the incest taboo was invented by men makes absolutely no sense. In any case, the ultimate rule isn't just an incest taboo, it's um, a rule against rape. No means no. Without that, without a rule against rape in any society, you can forget rules of any kind. Don't think about grammatical rules or table manners or all these various things. If you haven't got a rule against rape, if you haven't got a rule governed society, and life won't be very pleasant for anyone. So I see this story as about that no 
that powerful no, no means no, orchestrated by 13 wise women using the moon as their clock and signaling no at the moment of menstruation, at which point women go on strike. And can you see, if you're thinking in terms of human origins, going back to Africa and establishing culture and morality that way, can you see that it wouldn't make much sense for the woman over here to be saying no, and women over there saying, yes, we're happy to fix. Can you see that if you're on strike, can you see this? It needs to be what I would call a general strike right across the landscape. But the beautiful thing is that the moon doesn't care about borders. If you time your action to coincide with the new moon, you've got your general strike. Because wherever men go, those who are in two are menstruating and then their, their blood signals no. When you have um, a strike, one of the things you have to do is kind of make sure that it's solid. Um, as the trade union chair, <laughs> organizer for many years, different places, um, I'm quite familiar with this. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. What do you do to make sure that your strike is solid? You set up a picket line. Now, I do I give this. Seen a few of those lately. You must have seen a few of those. It's been rather hard to miss the picket lines of the last couple of years with this wretched girl. I must be political. I wasn't talking, uh, I wasn't talking Mick, about Mick Lynch had to teach that wretched Kay Burley the understanding of, of a picket of a, line. What a picket line. Yeah. The point about a picket line is that you don't cross it. And it's not about violence, it's that if you do cross, you are cursed. You are a scab. And shame on you. And you will have a hard time living it down because if you're a scab, you're trying to gain at the expense of your brothers and sisters selfishly because of course you won't you will accept what you know the pay rise whatever, whatever it is and the basic rule is never cheat on your brothers and sisters very very simple that's the logic of a picket line i argue that actually on the picket line it was on the picket line that all human culture, morality, language, kinship, everything else was born. All of the things which make us distinctively human, all those things were born on the world's first picket line. And this story is about that. It's about the world's first picket line. And I'm going to demonstrate it now. Where is the picket line in the story? Tell me where it is. A great hedge of thorns never cross a picket line. What happens to some idiotic young prince who thinks he can just get up his horse, take out his sword, wave it around, cut through the thorns and find his woman? Before, well, he, come, he comes to a sticky end. And it's just nice, to, I think it's very nice to think about this. I mean, you might think it's a little bit cruel, but after a few years, the whole of this hedge of thorns is kind of covered with the Skeletons, mm -hmm. ardent young men who didn't understand there that are no means no, and they're all at different of stages of composition. Some of them are fresh corpses with the crows sucking in the eyes. You've already got some of the the first ones that came in the first year. They're, they're like real skeletons. So we don't we don't want to delve into this too much, of course. <laughs> but no means no, and you do not cross, and you certainly don't cross a menstrual picket line because you will suffer from the curse. That's the whole point. Um, every period of menstrual seclusion has to come to an end. And um, have you noticed that in the story, the young man who makes his way in, there's nothing special about him. It's not that he's a prince. They're all princes. I mean, this is obviously with hundreds and gatherers, everyone's king. Everyone, When everyone's king, no one's king. I mean, it's quite a well-known fact about Bushman, Kalahari hundreds. Everyone, everyone's part of the royal family. This <laughs> is um, an anthropologist um, just said to you, "Oh, who's your headman? Who's your king?" And they, "Oh, I think you'll find we're all headmen around here. Everyone's king here, and that means nobody is." Because, but it's like a kind of leveling up. Everyone's royalty. The whole, you know, it's like the whole family, the human family, almost like the royal family. But here we have this idea. Um, uh, we have this idea that something is sacred. Um, this line of Thorns, hit a thorns is sacred. You do not cross. 
but it's only for a period because, of course, the, 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 um, the wise women have come to a kind of compromise that it will last for a um, hundred years instead of um, instead of forever. Um, right, he's nothing special. He's just the right man at the right at the right place, at the right time. He's arrived at the very moment. The story makes it really clear when the wise women themselves have agreed that their action would come to an end. It's a really long, really long, very long in duration, this, um, this, this uh, in, if you like, industrial action, everything stops. And but critically, what happens in, in real life in traditional cultures, when you have a girl's first menstruation ceremony, perhaps the most important thing is that all cooking stops. And that's because cooking, this is a whole volume of Claude Levy Sessions mythology, it's called the raw and the cooked. Point about cooking, Imagine you're hunters and gatherers, you've got your zebra, maybe in the ice age you had your mammoth, you put it in a big earth oven, cover it with hot stones, you leave it there for a day or two, everybody's very, very really quiet, must make a noise, otherwise the blood will bubble up. But how do you know whether the meat's cooked or not? You take it, take it out and you look, is there any blood in it? And the point about menstruation is that it adds to the blood. Cooking takes away from the blood. So you cannot mix the two, you cannot mix menstruation with cooking. And so one of the one of the fundamental rules around menstruation in all the world's cultures is that the cooking has to stop. Sometimes I hear people think saying to me, um, oh, these poor women, you know, when they're in menstrual seclusion, they're not allowed to have sex with their husband, they're not allowed to do his cooking, they're not allowed to wash his socks, all the things that a man wants from his wife, they're prevented from doing. And of course, the other side of it is hooray, 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 give us a break. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the other whole side of it. Anyway, this break has lasted 100 years. And at the end of it, you don't need violence. I'm sure he's got his sword. And as he arrives, the thorns turn into flowers. The hedge opens. He steps through. All the flunkies, all the servants, all the stable lads, all the cooks and scullery boys and maids, and all, all in different positions. Some of them lying on the ground, some of them frozen. And what happens is that he finds his way um, to where the princess lies um, asleep and he leans over and he kisses her very very romantic this bit he kisses her on the lips she wakes up and what happens is that the whole world wakes up with her so just as we had synchronized menstruation and synchronized collusion at the beginning when the spell is cast equally synchronized is the awakening and with the awakening comes marriage and they all lived happily ever after. Thank you. I'll just, I'll just say one more little thing, which is that Cinderella, Jack of the Beanstalk, shoes that were sons to pieces, they're all different versions of this fundamental idea that you're alive, the flow of blood, you move into the other world, that's not magic, okay? But then you come back from the dead, and that's magic. And perhaps I should just say, what I hear in this old wives' tale, don't forget, Kim Miller was mentioning it, these tales, they're old, women, old wives, storytellers, have managed to preserve those tales under terrible, terrible, terrible conditions of the witch burnings. And somehow, in order to, order to, to preserve these stories, the most powerful woman of all, Senior witch, if you like, has to be wicked, 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 wicked. You keep saying wicked long enough, wicked, 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 <laughs> you might get through the censorship. But I hear that wicked, wicked, wicked witch and all her sisters. I hear their voice when I hear that story. You men, you think you can control time. We'll give you a lesson about time. We'll lock you in it. You'll lock you in time for a hundred years. And when we've decided, then and only then will we set you free. That's the voice I, I hear in that story. Okay. So thank you. Wonderful. Uh, and we have 
any questions we Manchego, you've got your hand up on zoom if you want to you could go first um okay um there, speak up? okay there was one thing that um one group that that also bled in this story the poor bastards that tried to climb up to get the princess <laughs> they bled and they died and i never heard anything about them coming back <laughs> they didn't come back. I'm, I'm afraid they, up. they did a very bad thing. Sorry. Yeah, you're yeah, meant the, to be. I can't okay. Sorry. No, 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 no. The question is: there was somebody. It wasn't just the the um, little briar rose who bled. Those foolish uh, men who um, <laughs> by right, right, those foolish men who thought no, it doesn't mean no. They could just take a sword out. They bled too. And I suppose to answer your question, I mean, we don't know exactly, but I very much doubt whether those poor people came back to life. I have a feeling they did such a bad thing that they they, they, they died and they stayed dead. But unless anyone was getting any evidence of resurrection of these uh, strike breakers, um, strike, strike breakers don't, don't, don't come back to life. They don't. They don't. <laughs> yes. I did it. I did have one more, one more. Uh, thing. Quickly, Manchego, Quickly, we've got some, we've got some questions. Oh, go on, Manchego. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. Um, there was, you know, you know the story about when Hera and Zeus were arguing about who who enjoyed sex the most. Kind of, yes, I know that story. Yeah. So they brought in as a judge um, Tiresias, a Tiresias. guy who had Tiresias. They brought him in because he had um, hit. Uh, there was a pair. Of, he came across a pair of snakes, maybe, and he mm -hmm. hit the female, or he hit the, the hit them to break them up. And he, what he hit was the female, and instantly he was turned into a woman. And he lived as a woman for seven years. And he learned that about who had the best sex. And so he, when he, he had to judge it, he pissed off Hera by, by taking Zeus's side. And she struck him blind. And because, like in this story, um, he, Zeus didn't want the curse to be that bad. Um, he gave him the gift of prophecy. Great. Okay. So Lovely. that's that's one more variant. Thank you very much, Manchego. Right uh -huh. here we have a question. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Please speak up. No, no, Just speak, speak up. up. <laughs> Just. Yeah. Um, why do you think that uh, it would it had to be a non it had to be a non consensual way? Oh, I didn't say that. Some people think that. Yeah, it's just I feel that, like, when I didn't hear your story, I think implicitly to me the story was more about the fact that, yeah, guys can do whatever. This, I, I got it, and I get back. So I, I always saw this myth as something very powerful. And then, oh, like, this guy has, like, any power over a woman and he can just kiss her. And so these people have to meet him and be like, oh, it's my friend. And that's friend. what my interpretation was always, always was. Yeah. Something very powerful. Well, I mean, there's no doubt the myth is patriarchal. I can tell you the, the full-on patriarchal interpretation of the story. Um, it's in uh, called woman hating, and the, the essence of it all is that if you're um, a woman, you need to lie on your back for a hundred years and wait for a prince to um, arrive and, and wake you up. And if you're a man, you've got to take your sword and conquer all the enemies and conquer your bride, um, and that's it. Um, it's just that although that is, you know, I'm sure that's a meaning of the story that people will get. It doesn't explain the 12 golden plates, the 13 silver ones, the frog, <laughs> um, the hedge of thorns. It doesn't, ex I mean, I want an explanation which interprets all the details and makes them all come together. Now, my view is that the final kiss is no doubt about it, it's consensual. Why do I think that? Because the thorns, 
turn into flowers, flowers and open. Now, if you think about it, thorns turning into flowers, the petals opening, that is a metaphor for a part of the human female body which welcomes in um, the guy. I mean, it's, not, it's pretty obvious to me mm. that, she, that he's being welcomed in by that, that thing. And the reason he's welcomed in is because, not because he's anything special, it's just because the women decided enough is enough. We made our point. Hundred years is quite a long time to make a point, and now um, let's have some sex. <laughs> You're so right. That's what Shayla was saying at the beginning: is that like, in order for that story to exist over time, when we're moving from a societal or a cultural or a religious practice, even that was going from pagan lunar to then to patriarchy solar. Mm -hmm. Those stories wouldn't necessarily, we're not saying that story would have started exactly like that, might be back in, we're saying it evolves over time, but still keeps the central message. Well, this, this story clearly reflects a moment when the Christians arrived and decided, right, months are not moons. You've got 12 of them, and, this, and the critical thing in the sky, the clock, is not going to be the moon, it's going to be the sun. And just guess what? All over the world, whenever you get this switch to kings, you know, establishment of, of, of stable patriarchy, the gods are always sun gods. Uh, the motto is always let there be light. You never find let there be darkness. Okay, we ever had let there be darkness in a patriarchal story. I mean, yeah. but I mean, the fact is the Hadza. Hunter Gallagher's in Tanzania, the Kabila's going to work with, they say exactly, let there be darkness. All their major rituals, epime, happen in the dark time of the month because any light pollution will interfere with the communication with the, with the, with the stars, where the ancestral spirits probably are. And, and darkness is the condition of being able to see beyond this world. If there's too much light, you're, you're in this world, you can see everything. You want to go into the inner life, you want to get into the darkness. So the sun is kind of the, the clock all patriarchs, pretty much. I mean, you get a bit of, you usually get a bit of both. You get a bit of patriarchy, but a bit of, a bit of sun, a bit of moon. But the moon definitely gets demoted. Uh, 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 but, and also it becomes feminine. The hunter gatherers, the moon is woman's other husband. It's, a, it's the husband you're with. Or when you're, brother. Or with, yes, it's, it's your woman. It's, yes, it's your, so when you're in seclusion, you're with another husband who's, who's <laughs> entry into your body is your menstruation. Your, the moon is inside you. It's a lovely film, by the way, called The Moon Inside You, by a friend of mine. So you can, can find it very quickly all about how the anthropology of all this. But the moon, that, for hunter gatherers, almost universally, the moon is male. It's your other husband. And then with patriarchy, it gets demoted to female. You know, patriarchy assumes that female is underneath and male is on top. And then it puts the moon down there as a female and, it's, and the sun is again with Aboriginal Australians the sun is actually usually female and the moon is male with patriarchy it's the other way around the sun becomes male the moon becomes female in general I mean with all these things there are obviously going to be exceptions but the, even the exceptions you can soon work out there's a pattern there any more questions in the room yes I was wondering how you interpret the marriage the marriage being um now we have a new well okay there's very interesting it's story okay thing. so the the question here from the room is um how do i interpret the the wedding at the very end is this ah oh, the strike's being successful we've got a good settlement now and we can all we can get we can uh, we can agree to a marriage um sort of. okay so the way i look at it is that all of these magical myths and fairy tales, the ones that Levi Strauss, the thousand versions that Levi Strauss uh, examines in his mythology from North and South America, but also our European fairy tales, there's two things going on. One's a, a wavy line life, death, life, death, life, death, full moon, dark moon, full moon, dark moon, waxing, waning, waxing, waning. So you know, there's a, just a periodicity. So that's the fundamental structure. You have life. You have death, and you come back to life, and you do it again. Just a cyclical structure. No, no, nothing's going on. There's no one's going anywhere. But then you get an overlay. And in the overlay, there's a story with a, a beginning, middle, and an end. And the end, of course, is here we are. So we have patriarchy. We have marriage. We have a man who marries a woman, and that's it. 
she doesn't divorce him again. I mean, this story, you'd be very surprised if this story said, and then uh, two weeks later, she said, no, I've changed my mind. <laughs> no, it's pretty final, this, this marriage. But of course, under patriarchy, marriage is exactly that. It's final. You're, you're suddenly fixed in, you're, you're fixed in being a wife. You said yes a long time ago. You're not allowed to say no. You said yes. Can I can I yeah. say something about um, Hadza hunter gatherers? Because there is no such assumption necessarily between a woman and and her husband, the hunter, um, about whether or not they're going to stay married. In order to demonstrate that they're staying married, must be there must be observation of menstrual taboos um, by both the man and the woman, and the, and that observation is. What that means to keep those menstrual taboos is a, a man cannot go hunting at the time of his wife menstruating, and um, and a woman can't go collecting berries or or honey um, because that would dry or the berries would all fall on the ground and be spoiled. So that is like it's like a sort of public understanding that if the couple observe those those things, those taboos and the rituals. They stay married, but it's like every time she's menstruating, it's it's up for being. Although, so of course, I, I'm sure Camilla would agree, but even the word "married" is a little bit difficult because we tend to sort of think marriage is marriage, and we tra we translate to other cultures our own sort of concepts. So, bride service is the is the correct term to use. So, it's a, it's with bride service societies, and that's a, the bride service is the fundamental economic institution of. Um, immediate return hunter-gatherers. That means hunter-gatherers who don't practice storage and who therefore haven't developed a kind of hierarchy based on inequality of, of wealth or stored property. So immediate return means the kind of hunters and gatherers we were for you know, 160,000 years, you can have different figures, but ever, ever since we became modern homo sapiens. So you don't have, you don't have weddings, you have a bride service. And bride service, the interesting thing is, it's, it, the best way to think of bride service is if it's like a man wants to have a, a sort of legitimate relationship with a woman for obvious reasons, um, but he's 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 kind of on trial. He's got to be. He's got to behave. He's got to behave. He's got to behave. And there's periods of being on trial because his his partner, his sweetheart, and her mum in particular. Her mum is in charge. She's in charge of everything. He's got to go hunting, surrender all the meat to the mother-in-law, and he never gets there he never gets to a point he gets to a point where he's very much trusted and, and accepted he's very he's proved himself he, he bounces the babies on his knees he's been a, a kind generous thoughtful modest hunter all that but he never gets to the point where he can say right you're my wife i've got conjugal rights in you that never happens it's, it's, it's as if that's delayed um forever whereas of course under patriarchy it's the first thing that happens you know you have a wedding and that's it okay you're not you're not a, a woman anymore or not like a sister you're now a wife you said that's one little one ceremony a few words by some priest has cut off all your options you no longer have freedom of choice okay Ara aradia um do you want to ask a question um i sort of a question i i'm just um focusing on the concept of consent um in terms of these uh, and look i understand the symbology involved um implies that there's consent um, but I also see it as a, an issue of actually removing um, the autonomy of consent from the actual young woman so it's like um, it's like laying the groundwork for that notion that she has to be given away um, and I was just wondering if anybody else sort of well I must say I don't see that I mean, no one's giving her away, well, are they? Yeah, no, I'm saying, I'm saying that the symbology um, is is implying consent, but it's still not direct consent. So it's um, sort of removing that autonomy from the person, from the young woman herself, to say yes. She, it's it's implied that that's a natural consent there I, think I suppose that's what's yeah. catching me up a little bit it feels like it's, 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 it's like very if you watch the Disney version I would totally agree mm. but it's really about yeah. women 
she's yeah. Well. yeah it's about the collect it's about the collective now so so what what Libby is saying can you hear everybody yeah. what Libby is, what not... is saying is that it's not about in the disney version it is about a particular woman batting her eyelids smiling being all rough. <laughs> here it's nothing to do with it there's no individuals really no and i and look i understand that it's just yeah. it's it feel you know i mean this is just a thought that i'm going with um it just has that underlying thing that it takes away the voice of women in that sense. I, I will, I want to make a concession, at, but on a different level. It is very, very much the case that in hunter gatherer societies, egalitarian, I mean, gender egalitarian hunter gatherer societies, it's not like everyone has individual freedom of choice to do whatever they like. There are these fundamental rules and taboos around sex. And when a girl menstruates, you'll find that with a will, with kind of ardour, she lets her, her mum and other relatives sort of grab hold of her and keep her away from the boys. Now, she may sort of feel a little bit, oh, actually, I'd like to be having some fun with the boys. I'm sorry. <laughs> her her guardians are going to say, no, 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 that's not good. And what they will say is, we, if we just let you do what you like, you'll end up pregnant and left holding the baby. We want to make sure that you're properly looked after, you're part of a collective, and we want any man you end up having sex with, we want to make sure that he understands that he's not going to be in charge. He's going to be, he's going to be, he's going to be thoughtful and kind to us as a family of women and, and our brothers and so on. So I'm just saying that you're right if you're saying we don't have individual freedom of choice across the board. No way. No, and that's basically what I'm saying is that to, to me it's taken away the, her voice in, in in being able to do that. Well, it is, yes. I mean, yeah, I agree with it. It's, it's a collectivist society. It's, I mean, it's, it's so much more beautiful and complex than that. Hunter-gatherer societies, Jerome Lewis is a great expert on this and he's, he's, he'll be giving a talk later on, but hunter-gatherer societies combine these two things, a really solid sense of collective identity and collective responsibility with... Every individual being such an individual, there's such individualism, so many people are so different. Every character has got their own sort of, you know, their own lines, their own ways of doing things. So we combine a, a real free individualism with a strong collectivism, but there are rules are rules. And a girl who begins to menstruate, she doesn't have freedom of choice. She can't just say, I feel like going hunting with the men. I feel like having lots of sex. I, no, no, no. Her, her relatives will say, no, that's not going to be good for you. We know better than you do on this one. <clears throat> Fair enough. Thank you. Thanks. So um, I'll take you again, if unless there's some other. But yeah, go go for it. So on what you were saying, would you think scare the king so much in menstruation? What scared the king so much about menstruation? <laughs> right. Okay. So, okay. I mean, I'll just tell you a, a kind of brief comic strip version of history and prehistory. First, you have a human revolution when we get um, symbolic culture, including rules of morality, like a fundamental no means no, blood is how we say no, and it's once a month. And this means that your cycle, synchronized with the moon, can be the engine governing the work rhythms of society. Because it's perfectly possible with big game hunters to hunt, you know, in the Ice Age, hunting a, a mammoth, North America hunting a giant camel, Australia hunting a diver toad on these are huge animals. You kill one, you're made for the next you know, for the month. You, you need to you can slow right down, you can slow your hunting down to once a month ceremonial hunt organized by the menstrual cycle in conjunction with the moon so that you hunt from full moon onwards when you can see all out all night and in africa the lions aren't around because they like to punch on you in the dark it's also the reason why hunting would be a once a month thing but when you when that when the game animals become extinct over hunting people having to hunt small animals a meal for a day or two and then you've got to hunt again can you see what's going to happen the, the economic necessity to keep foraging and finding animals is is going to come up against the menstrual taboos, the menstrual cycle is going to get in the way. So if supposing you're, you know, you're in I don't know, California or somewhere, Native Americans there, and you're hunting rabbits, and some old lady says, no, 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 you mustn't hunt now, the moon's in the wrong place. It's, um, you know, you have to wait till it's waning. It's, hang on a bit, I haven't, we have, we're starving, my wife's starving. Can you see what's going to happen? 
the continuous hunting of smaller animals and the gathering by women is just not compatible with lunar scheduled periodicity. Instead, as increasingly um, humans get into farming, uh, it's a long story there, of course, it's going to be seasonal rhythms that take over and the sun takes over. So um, I'm just wondering, <laughs> kind of wondering if I've, if I've explained it. It's like, the, okay, so then you're saying, why does the king have a problem with menstruation? I'm, I'm suggesting actually everyone has a problem with menstruation because women start menstruating at very inconvenient times. You know, and so if you keep the taboo, if if women are now menstruating and everyone's going to stop what they're doing, but they have to do they have to do stuff otherwise they're starved. Can you see? It's like a clash between the moon and the menstrual cycle, a clash between that and economic necessities. Whereas for a hundred thousand years or so, the two went together. We became human on the basis of a once a month ceremonial hunt governed by the moon because it sense, makes a lot of sense to hunt when there's enough light in the sky to see overnight. And then with onset of farming, seasonality takes over. And then your kings, if you like, your, your big men, now they're going to find menstruation getting in the way. And so when you do menstruate, instead of that, that being, a, being a, a sacred time for you, you're going to get shoved down the, the bottom of the valley into some little hut somewhere um, but, so that your pollution doesn't um, interfere with everything. But in that situation, of course, um it is the big men or the, the men as groups who take over yeah. the work of culturally, ritually synchronized menstruation. So we have this whole um, you know, array of different ritual ways that men do the menstruating all over. It's yeah. a big well, well-known phenomenon in anthropology. I don't think Chris can- I can't, I can't really cover everything, but I mean, no. but I mean there's, there's not, um... There's not a, a men's house in the world. You know what I mean by a men's house? A big, big house where all the men perform their rituals with their bull rules, with their secrets. There's not a men's house in Papua New Guinea or Amazonia or anywhere else where the men don't menstruate. I mean, of course, they can't really menstruate, but they, you know, they cut their ears, they bleed from the nose. They, you know, in our in Australia, they cut the penis and all that. So the men have to bleed. Second. Because then they can control the bleeding. They can cut themselves with a knife or cut each other, but cut the boys with a knife. So I'm just saying, your your question was originally, what? Why does the king have a problem with menstruation? Um, actually, in real life, what happens with these male secret cults is that the men take over menstruation because then they can control it because they're doing the bleeding. And you'll find that even even the, even say the Freemasons in London here you'll find that their secret, secret, secret ritual involves cutting the tongue and bleeding, all that huge, huge secrecy around it, but it essentially goes back um, to these things. We have the blood. Well, of course. Jesus we go. We go. takes the blood and Mary, Virgin Mary, has none. She's so a woman Virgin without... Mary blood. has all blue, no red at all, no, no, no blood, and it's, her son has all the um, bleeding, yeah. Uh, By the way, that's there, the there is Ian. Ian, are you wanting to talk about Paulina's question, or did you have something else? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I mean, Paulina was asking about what, why, the antithesis between menstruation and cooking. She was asking it as a symbolic question, but I right. think I think you know um, the Paulina. model is, is 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 specifying if it's a lunar hunt. And so that this massive animal is brought back, or people move to consume the, this massive animal at around full moon, and it's going to last you, you know, quite a while—a week, ten days. Mm -hmm. um, then the logic is not not just symbolically, but like practically, that yeah. there is no longer any meat in the camp at dark moon. Yeah. The, the, the kids are beginning to scream, and so do you want to say more? So, okay. so, so, what happens when we became culturally human is that we had what are sometimes called institutional facts, which are facts, which are facts, objective facts, but simply by agreement. And so you have. So if you're if you're doing things using the sun and the moon as your clock, so you, I mean. Humans just, we can't possibly plan a future event like a, a, a hunt without some kind of clock, some kind of measurement of time. So if it's the moon, the simplest way of dividing up time is just bisect it. 
Now, you, if you've got slightly more light or slightly less light, I mean, that's possible, but it's like, you know, it's an analog difference. It's, it's how much light, how much light can there be for you to be <laughs> ritually allowed to go hunting? So the simplest way to do it is just simply say waxing versus waning. So if you've got waxing versus waning, then on one in one category, from, from new moon, when the blood flows right up to full moon, when the, the blood taboos disappear, you've got um, no cooking, um, no marital sex, a whole lot of things, like certainly no marriage in that period. And then at full moon, all those spells, those taboos suddenly are lifted. And now you can, you can enjoy sex um, because women aren't covered in blood anymore. You can eat the meat because that's, that's now cooked. It hasn't got the blood in it. So all those things go together. So there's a reason why cooking and marital sex and uh, all sorts of other things. And Levi-Strauss goes into great detail about this. I haven't made these things up. He, he, I mean, another one is noise, for example. Noise belongs with blood because noise, uh, not, making a lot of noise is a way of breaking up couples. So if you want to organize a sex drive, you, want, you don't want to have sweet, lovely, romantic music. You want to make a lot of noise with, with what Levi-Strauss called instruments of darkness, like, rather like saucepans banging. Remember the old Charibari when an old man was married to a very young woman and all the villagers think that's a disgrace. They, can't, they go under the couple's bed, <laughs> bedroom and bang all the saucepans. So noise, um, blood, death, wet, blood relations, rawness, all those things go in one category, which is waxing moon. And then in the other category, we have uh, uh, quiet or, or, or musical harmony um, and feasting and marital sex and blah, blah, blah. A whole so you just divide everything into two waxing versus waiting and it and that and so that's so it's not just symbolism it's not just that cooking symbolically mustn't be linked to menstruation is an actual in an actual ritual process one does not cook when menstruating and there are good traditional reasons why and of course even today if you do have a, a menstrual taboo, even in this country, sort of <laughs> sometimes they're out a little bit. You mustn't you mustn't wash your hair. You will wear straight there is things. But if you're if you're thinking about a menstrual taboo, no, 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 no. Cooking is a terrible thing to do while you're while you're on your period. Really terrible. <laughs> Doesn't work very well anyway. Um, is is there anyone else on Zoom asking question? John, you had an interesting question. Is there anyone in the room? all because otherwise we're gonna um bring it together i think john did you want to put that because that's one last interesting question that fits with what uh okay chris was just saying this is about interpretation of circumcision are we taking male circumcision i, I yes. don't know if we want to start yes, yes taking male about. circumcision um which of course male circumcision, circumcision yes. is another yes. version of... yeah i mean male, male circumcision is, is well i mean Okay, what happens when the patriarchs take over is that they say that when women menstruate, it's kind of rubbish, but when men do it, it's great. And when women give birth, it's rubbish, because all women can do is produce a lump of flesh. But if, if you want a soul, the, the little baby is going to be twice born. And so it's like circumcision is like the, the rabbi, whoever it is, he says, well, look at this kid. It's, oh, yeah, the women haven't done it properly. Look, you've got to cut the foreskin. <laughs> and then it's, that it's that it's proper it's got whatever, a yeah. so but african circumcision is is sometimes actually actually overtly called uh boys menstruation it, it can be called that overtly um not always but but it basically has so even in even in in like i don't know south east london not so long ago maybe even now a woman who's given birth she has to be churched and of course, it's not until the baby's been dunked into another womb and you know, dunked in the water, the priest puts some abracadabra over it and it comes out again. But it's um it's properly got a soul. Otherwise, it's covered in an original sin. You see, when when a, when a baby's born of a woman, it's been in contact with her insides, all that blood, and that's terrible. That's original sin. So to get rid of that, the priest's got to come along and do the second birth, and then the kid's reborn, and then it's okay. okay that's patriarchal way of saying that women can't do anything. Can't do anything proper. Yeah, we've got the so, I mean, I mean, we're going to stop fairly soon. I've just, I suppose, what Kabila was saying earlier on is that, um, you know, in the period we're in, with what's going on in the world, with all the bloodshed and all the horrors of, you know, the culmination of where patriarchy was bound to end up, I suppose, when men ruling the world made a huge mess of it anyway. But this is a, a God Almighty mess. It does seem a little bit difficult to be here 
um, discussing fairy tales. But as Camilla was saying, these stories are crystallized knowledge and wisdom. And they're telling us of a time when we became human, when we didn't have boundaries, we didn't have wars, we didn't have marriage, we didn't have all these property, all these things, all those things. And um, and these stories are the almost the only real solid evidence of all that. Of course, you can interpret the stories in different ways. But what Levi says was trying to do was to say, well, yeah, but some ways make sense because they kind of connect up. So what we haven't discussed this evening is how, I mean, what about Jack and the Beanstalk? Is that the same thing? What about Cinderella? Red what about Riding Hood. Red Riding Hood. What about the shoes that were danced to pieces? I've got a whole book here. Yeah. <laughs> All these stories. Um, I can tell you now that actually, when you look at these stories through this lens, suddenly they start speaking to you. Suddenly they're, they're, they're crystal clear. Like you've just said, oh my God, every detail is in its right and proper place. Everything is clear. And if you don't look at it through that kind of lens, it's just, oh, one story and then another and then another, all these complicated details, and you think, what the hell? Um, so then they're not speaking. Uh, what's important is to hear that voice, I think. Mm. Uh, and um, to do that, you've got to listen. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So just a couple of things. If anyone's interested in some of the other fairy tales we have here on for a couple of quid, is it? Or, so, uh, there's only a couple of files for, well, we kind of in really, really want to read it. And um, I'm going to say goodbye to Zoom, but I just wanted to say for next week, we are going to come back to fairy tales. We always have a winter solstice Xmas fairy tales where the voice of the women is actually almost more powerful than it is in Sleeping Beauty. It's, it's even more anti-patriarchal and anti-marriage. It should be put that way. Um, next week, we have a very interesting political anthropology talk uh, from Natalia Buitron and Hans Steinmuller. Um, Natalia has worked with the Ashwa in Ecuador, um, Hans with, uh, well, peasant in peasant China. Um, they are very interested in the issue of egalitarianism. Their title is very provocative for us. Egalitarianism is hierarchy, um, autonomy is mutual aid, mutuality. So it's going to be talking about, they're, they're going to be referencing this um, recent book you might have heard of, of uh, Weber and Wengrow to some extent, I think. Um, and uh, so it should be a very, yes, that, that one. And it should be a good uh, discussion for that. So really worth coming back. Um, what else? I'm going to say goodbye to Zoom and thank you so much for coming. It was a really wonderful audience and great questions tonight. Thank you very much. I hope you'll be able to join us again next week. And I'm going to leave, I think. I'm going to say bye now.